Welcome everybody to another episode of the Curling for Change podcast. My name is Will Robertson. I'm here with Daryl Nowlin, who we I'll let him introduce himself in a moment for a conversation from uh, Curling with Pride. So we did a group conversation on this that you'll see uh, wherever you get your podcast on YouTube very shortly, if not already. Uh, but we thought we would do a one-on-one -on -one conversation because as you'll come to learn, uh, Daryl and I have known each other for quite a long time. So we're going to get right into our conversation um, and jump around some some stories from from ourselves, from Daryl, learn a little bit more about him, um, but also some of the topics that are, are near and dear to your heart, of course, with the, the subject being curling with pride. So uh, welcome, Daryl, to this adventure. <laughs> thanks, Will. Thanks for the invite. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. Um, it's a really good thing that you're doing. This is awesome. No problem. Thank you. So for people who may or may not know you, um, give us a little bit of information about who you are, what you're currently doing, um, your relationship in the curling world, because some people have certainly seen you on, on TSN. Um, you might have gone to the Briar a few times, I don't know. Um, but just touch upon a bit of that for, for the folks at home. Sure, so uh, I'm a curling coach. Now I'm a curling coach based in Moncton, um, Moncton, New Brunswick. I uh, grew up in PEI uh, where I did a lot of junior curling. So went to a few junior championships there. Um, coach team at the Briar from there, moved to New Brunswick to go to university. And that's when I went to the Briar for New Brunswick uh, and then really got into coaching. So I coached men's and women's teams at the Briar and the Scotties Terminal Hearts uh, a number of times over the years. Of course, my big claim to fame is coaching you and uh, my boys, my two sons at uh, U18s and uh, U20s um, a couple of times. So uh, I've also coached, uh, most recently, people would have seen me at the Scotties coaching Andrea, Andrea Kelly, um, Team New Brunswick. So uh, I've been at this for probably 30 something years now, Will, uh, at the coaching and uh, seen a lot of changes. I've gone through a lot of changes, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And uh, big fan of curling and uh, really glad that it's a uh, in my experience, a very inclusive sport and uh, open to these kinds of dialogues. So I look forward to our chat. Yeah, for sure. And, and we'll dive into some of the inclusivity aspect um, in a second. So yeah, Daryl has coached me for quite a long <laughs> for a while um, with uh, his two sons. Um, and that's been an adventure in and of itself. Um, but also, you know, both of us are, are out and proud in our own rights. Um, myself as a curler, Daryl now as a coach both professionally, publicly, in our own lives as well. So um, we'll get into a bit of that in, in, in a moment. Um, I guess I just want to kind of ask, you know, when for, for you, curling kind of intersected with, with who you are and, and, and your sexuality and, and that, you know, gen, gender sexuality kind of conversation for you or, or that journey? Sure. sure. So um, now I'll say I identify as a gay man um queer gay i i use those terms kind of pretty interchangeably um depending on what room i'm in um i mean how does curling intersect with who you are like you are who you are in whatever room you walk into but um for a bit of background i guess for folks um i was in a heterosexual marriage for the technically 10 years, I guess, but, you know, in relationships for longer than that with uh, my uh, partner at the time, Denise, who I was also her coach. She's been to, I think, five Scotties. Uh, and I was Denise's coach. She played with, uh, with uh, a couple of different folks, but again, most notably Andrea Kelly. Um, and kind of came to the conclusion that uh, it was time for me to come out, sort of accepting who I was and who I am and uh, actually came out and my marriage broke up as I was coaching Andrea's team. Um, Denise was the most understanding and supportive partner that anybody can imagine kind of going through that situation. So we sort of lived that together. It was, I'm coming out, we're breaking up. I'm still your coach. How do we manage all those relationships? So that happened, uh, I'm gonna say 2010, 2011, somewhere's in there. So uh, it was big gossip in the curling world, probably for a little while. 
Uh, but as all other gossip and news, it kind of it kind of flares up, and then something else exciting happens, and people forget about you. Yeah, well, I mean, nobody nobody could forget about you, Daryl. I mean, come on now. True. Um, so thanks for and thanks for keeping my profile alive. <laughs> I, I try. I have to keep mine up too. Um, yeah. So you know, I, I just want to dive into that for for a second, sure. just because I was ten at the time, um, but also just thinking, you know, a lot of people don't have that experience of, of coming out as an adult, and especially when you're in a marriage with, with children. And just, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, you, you talk about Denise being one of your strongest supporters at the time, and just how exactly that, that impacted you, but also how that developed, because of course, that's a very scary, difficult situation to, to manage, um, yeah. like in a marriage, first of all, as a parent, second of all, and thirdly, as you're kind of on your own personal journey. Um, so maybe if you wanted to speak to that a little, because I'm sure some folks may, may want to sure. know more about that. Sure. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much an open book, uh, you know, try to, I guess, respect my family's privacy a little bit in telling these stories. But um, so I came out when I was 40, you know, like very big midlife crisis. Um, being completely honest, you know, I went through most of my life, like things pop into your head at certain points in your life where you think, hmm, I wonder. But then, you know, I grew up in a small town and small communities at a time when being gay just is, wasn't an option. It's kind of the way it was in my head. So you just kind of pack that away and you're not. And then you meet someone that you love and you get into a heterosexual relationship. And then you're, I'm just on that track and that's who I am and really no regrets. Then at a certain point, you know, sort of as time went on, I get older, you, you know, you're, you, you start thinking about things and you start thinking differently. And um, I would be, you know, lying if I didn't say sort of the two years before I came out. And Denise and I had conversations during those two years, but the big sort of, you know, this is it, I'm, I'm out, I'm gay, this is what's happening, um, was horrible. Like, frankly, like it, at, from a personal perspective, struggle I would say it was it was terrible it was horrible I was in therapy I was trying to figure it out um do I come out do I just you know I've picked my path suck it up and live it you've got two kids uh, one of my kids has some stuff going on with a little bit of challenges so what kind of father in person th like kind of walks walks away from all that and I didn't have a model or a, uh, a view of how I could live as a happy, separated gay man and still be an active participant in my kid's life. So I didn't really see that out there for, for me as an option. So I really felt it was a binary choice, like stay and be part of your family or go and you're leaving all that. I was able to figure out that, okay, that's not truly how it is. And again, had like the most supportive and understanding partner in Denise. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. You're married for 10 years. Your husband comes out gay. There was days when she was not a fan of me, like hugely and rightly so. Um, but grosso modo, like she was amazing. And that made the transition in the, the curling, in the curling world mm -hmm. easy too, because yeah. she was part of that circle. And people kind of took their lead from her. Mm -hmm. If she was angry and pissed off and uh, I was the devil in her eyes mm -hmm. or, or she treated me that way, then I think people, our mutual friends in the community would kind of take her lead because she didn't get a vote in all this. So this was pretty much a unilateral decision on my part. So, um, you know, if you want to say like victim, uh, mm -hmm. uh, devil, like, I was the latter and she was the former, uh, but she didn't treat me that way. Like, yeah, there was difficult times, 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I really credit the sort of seamless, positive transition for me uh, to her, like it, almost exclusively. Like it's uh, quite remarkable. No, and, and, and that's kind of a, a beautiful path to go through, which... I think, you know, and thank you to speaking to that, because of course, you know, respecting the, the privacy of, of her, but also your family, like that's something that a lot of people can be inspired from or learn from, because there's a lot of people who may have a similar struggle to that right now that may not 
quite know how to deal with the situation or approach the situation. So I, I appreciate you speaking to that a little. Um, yeah, and my message to people that are, you know, if there's somebody that's in that situation now, I would say, looking at my experience as the model that you can expect mm -hmm. is perhaps a bit unrealistic. Honestly, mm -hmm. like, I don't think that can be your expectation because I think there's a good chance you'll be disappointed because uh, it was pretty unique. But, um, you know, it, it, it's also not going to necessarily be terrible. It's yeah. not terrible and awful that often. I mean, I think another thing that I would be remiss if I didn't point out, I mean, listen to me talk, look at my mannerisms. It wasn't a shocker to people, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't present as Mr. Butch, right? So I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that said to me, oh, we all knew it's about time you caught up kind of thing, <laughs> right? And, yeah. uh, you know, I was super uncomfortable with that 10 years ago when people say that, but now like, yeah, I totally, I get it. Yeah, for sure. No, and and I think, you know, that that's, it's always an important thing to caveat. And I say that all the time about, about, you know, my own story is like, I'm lucky. You know, I had a, a family that accepted me in a, you know, as I said recently in the symposium, you know, I had parents who looked at me and went, no, we love you. And that was, let's move to the next conversation, right? The, where as a lot of people don't get that same experience. And, um, yeah. you know, whenever I talk about, about that with anyone, it's kind of like, okay, like we need to take a moment to recognize that, I was in a, a, a lucky situation where I was kind of grateful to have that support, whereas a lot of people don't get it. Um, so that's that's very, very valid to point to. Um, you know, you, you spoke a bit to how the curling world reacted. Um, could you give a bit of insight of, of what that looked like for, for you and the reaction to it? Did you feel as if you had been kind of treated differently or was it a bit of a kind of here's a pariah situation or was it more of the like you kind of spoke to a little of oh it's about time like we kind of knew kind of thing like just speak to a little bit of that reaction sure uh so I guess the first folks in the curling community that knew was our team mm -hmm. right so he was playing with Andrea at the time so Andrea Jody and uh, Joe Babin uh were our team at the time and uh, poor Jill, she was like 21, I think, or 20, like last year a junior, and she gave up her last year a junior to join uh, our team and our first team meeting in the fall. So was basically, okay, we have news, Denise and I. And she was like, what, what the heck have I signed up for here? Yeah. Um, but again, you know, the team and I were, were, were close. They, again, they took their lead from, from Denise and were supportive and she was cool with it and it was cool. And, uh, and, and you know, we went to the Scotties together in February. So that conversation would have happened like in September and we were at Scotties mm -hmm. in, in February. Um, and I remember the conversation about what do we put in the, when you fill out your bio form and it goes yeah. in, then you had the heart chart, which was like a, a daily newspaper that would be out around, right? And each team gets profiled. And what do we put aside? Marital status was the thing that went in there, right? And I, and I can't remember if we put single, probably put single, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Um, I kind of, when you come out, when you go through a coming out experience, especially in my situation where I was married, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little bit bigger news. You kind of lose control of it, Right. I am a bit of a control freak and uh, like to like manage. And there were times when like, oh, you're telling so-and-so or oh, so-and-so knows. And oh, well, I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Um, but as soon as you come out, you, you kind of lose all that. And there was times when I was less comfortable or times when I was more comfortable. Uh, but at a certain point, I, I kind of just let the gossip mill look after it, right? Like I told the team, Mm -hmm. People that mattered to me, we told. People that were mattered to Denise, she told. Um, and then you just, everyone knows everyone. So you just assume everybody knows, right? And, and sure enough, they did. There was one situation I remember being in the curling club and I'm kind of standing up sort of near the glass and there were uh, a group of guys behind me at a table. And I might be totally paranoid, but I'm pretty sure they were all talking about me. Like mm -hmm. I... I think that's what I heard. It was kind of like, oh, there's Daryl. And then you heard whispers and stuff like this. And this would be like days after 
that sort of the, the news was out. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, well, this is, this is it. And that was my biggest fear. Well, so at the time I was also coaching a men's team. I coached James Grattan. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I was coaching him that year or not. I think I was, but I was coaching him off and on through that period of time. Um, and I worried about that. I worried about, I had this circle of men, athletes who I coached with, uh, I coached or I was around and what were they going to think about that? What was their reaction going to be to that? You know, I'm in the locker room with them. Are they, is that going to freak them out? Like mm-hmm. all that stuff. Um, so I said, I remember this incident where there was people at the back uh, and it bugged me at the moment. And then I thought, well, of course they're going to gossip about it, Daryl. Like if you were in their shoes mm-hmm. and some curling couple that you know broke up, you'd be talking about it too, right? Mm-hmm. And then of the million gossip stories that I know over my years, they come and they go. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of recognize that I was the gossip of the day. And next thing you know, someone else will have a baby or break up or have an affair. And then that'll be the new gossip. And that's exactly what happened, right? So um, by the time I came out and, and that, that sort of thing started happening, I had already, the hard part was me coming to grips with it, which yeah. I'd gone through, right? So I can't think of a single curling person uh, that I felt unwelcome by uh, that a friendship that I lost or a judgment. Mm-hmm. I can't think of a single incident in the curling world where that happened to me, like not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. It was like, good for you. Yeah. You know, like good for you. Like it must be hard for you. It was more empathy than anything else. Yeah. And, and, and at a time where for a lot of people, that was still not necessarily the case. I mean, 2010 is like, we're not talking about being too far removed from a number of rights for the gay community coming into place in Canada. Like this is not like a, Hey yeah, guys, yeah, yeah, these yeah. rights have been around for a long time and everything's socially accepted. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah. Like you probably couldn't even get married then. And there is, I don't remember, but you know, there was like one gay character on Will and Grace and like, it wasn't yeah, kind of cool and trendy to be gay back then. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it certainly wasn't as, as socially accepted. And so to hear the kind of curling world accepted you more and that you hadn't really had an issue with that is, is of course, you know, encouraging and a similar experience to what, what yeah, I had. There wasn't, a ton of, there wasn't a ton of out athletes like no. there are now, right? Hmm. So. Yeah, and you, well, what, know, what, you, you mentioned you like how what was it like for you? Like you, you kind of were, have just been out. Yeah, like I, I, I mean, I came out when I was fifteen. So you know, um, in terms of <clears throat> to the control freak comment that you had mentioned, I took a different approach to being like, I'm done with it. I don't want to. I don't want to have the awkward conversation with anyone ever again. And so I just posted on Facebook. I was like, here it is, okay. boom, there you go. Um, and then, I mean, there was no walking away from that after that, right? It was, um, but at that point I had already come out to my parents. I had already come out to, uh, a couple of my best friends. I hadn't come out to my siblings. Um, and you know, my parents kept asking me like, Will, are you, are you going to tell them? Are you going to tell them? And I was like, no, I know they love me either way. So I don't really, I don't, I don't think I need to, which again, a lucky place to be, but I had that kind of comfort. Um, and then, I I mean, at that point, I'd already been curling competitively for two years because I played my first U21 provincial when I was 13. Um, and so I was welcomed by my team is is one thing. And I had like, I had a really good coach at the time, uh, Roland Robichaud, who was coaching his son on on my team. And he was amazing with me at, at a really turbulent time, both like, and he took it upon himself, not just to help me but also help my family. Like, and, w- and what I mean by that is if I was having a hard time on the ice for whatever personal reason, I was comfortable to talk to him when I might not have been as comfortable talking to my parents. And so sometimes he wouldn't kind of breach my trust, but he might say to my parents, like, Will's having a really hard time right now and in, in curling and it's impacting him in this way. You might want to ask him what's up or what's going on. And you know, whatever some people may think about it, that that was actually really helpful for me and my parents because that was a period of my life where like I did not get emotional with my family. I was kind of like, 
this is not something we talk about and like that's it um but the curling community was like fantastic to uh, to me and then you know i know even then there was not a lot of people who were out in juniors in particular um no, not at all not at all i coached juniors a lot during that period and no there was not yeah and you know i saw people after me yeah feel more comfortable i i remember you know one time you know when i was playing under 18s um a teammate of mine at the time showed up and i it was another one of those where like everybody kind of knew it was just waiting for him to find his moment to say yes hey guys i'm i'm gay um and, and, you know, one of my teammates and I kind of talked about it a few times of being like, I don't know when he'll come out, but we'll see. It's up to him. It's his, his, his journey and his decision. Um, and he showed up to our team meeting to plan for the season one time in August uh, with his family. And he got out and then his family got out and it was at my house. So I was like waiting at the like gate to my, my backyard to let them in. And out came his boyfriend. And that was his way of coming out. your boyfriend, you're pretty much out, right? Right. And that, that was his way of coming yeah. out was, hey, guys, by the way, this is my boyfriend so-and-so. And I was like, all right. <laughs> all right. So we're doing that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Like, you know, yeah. next. <laughs> um, yeah. you, know, it, you know, I took a moment to recognize, like, okay, thank you for feeling comfortable telling us, first of all. Second of all, thank you for feeling comfortable bringing him um because i that that can be you know anxiety inducing um For sure and especially at that age i think i was 16 or 17 at the time um and you know so so i was i was welcomed in that way and, and never really felt judged i mean of course when you're when you're that age you're always really anxious about similar things to what you spoke of of, of the locker room talk of what's going to be said and what's the gossip and whatever like Gossip wise, I kind of similar to you let go of it fairly quickly because those people are going to say what they're going to say and I, I can't lose my marbles thinking about it. Um, I think I was lucky because in my high school at the time and then also in curling, less so in curling, like in high school, the reaction was we'll have some humor around it and that'll be fine and not even derogatory jokes, just people would kind of make light of it. and. That was fine. Like I was, there was never anything that was said to me that was offensive in that way. There might be one where I was kind of like, okay, that I was stupid, but it was kind of funny. Right. Um, whereas in the in the curling world, nobody ever even really joked about it. It was kind of like, all right, it just was moving yeah. on. Um, so you know, again, a, a, a lucky situation to be in, but one where you know the curling community was was fantastic to me, really. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I'm, I'm always fairly thankful for that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so like, I, I just was wondering when you were talking about that, you know, did you find, cause you're in a very unique perspective where you've bridged both the women's game and coaching for so long with Andrea and with others, um, you know, and you've played in and coached in the men's game with James for a very long time had you felt you know you spoke to you didn't really face any issues or, or feel uncomfortable that much in, in that situation did you feel more welcomed by one section of the game or the other or was it just fairly universal and and kind of accepting you fairly universal i'd say like you know i had relationships over many years right so like when i was coaching say start with the guys james the people that I was, that he was playing against, you know, I used to play against those people or mm -hmm. the coaches I, or I coached at juniors when those guys were in juniors. Like, so you kind of already knew them and I don't feel that anything really changed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were a few other athletes, very few or coaches at the time that would sort of talk to me because either they were also gay and so they found like a bit of a kinship or were were kind of in the coming out process had a few conversations like that i mean when you're a gay man with the women 
I'm going to stereotype a little bit. <laughs> There's a little bit of one of the girls, right? So yeah. that's a super easy transition, mm-hmm. right? Um, I would say the team that I coached, James's team, the guys, and there were various people over the, the, the few years around there, like zero blowback, zero reaction, you know, maybe questions, like more just like your buddies would ask you questions, like, mm-hmm. man, like, what's that like? Like, how'd this happen? <laughs> that kind of stuff, right? Um, but like 1000% acceptance by my teammates, like not ever an issue. I never felt uncomfortable in those environments. I felt that my reputation, people that liked me still liked me and people that probably didn't like me before probably still didn't like me after. Um, So that was fine, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I I think, you know, I, I felt a similar thing from just being like, as I said, like generally, like universally accepted. Um, but of course, you and I are from very, very different generations. Although I would like to say you're 30, but you know, I, I can't no, get away with I, that I one. Am, I am in my head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you and I come from very different generations and very different kind of cultural understandings of like, this is what it means to be in, in the queer community or what have you from when we grew up. Because by the time I was in high school, it was a fairly normal thing, like not as public as it is now, but still you kind of came out and it was an event and then it wasn't. Um, I, I just kind of thinking like from your life and growing up and what have you, you know, you spoke to this a little bit at the beginning, how much did that impact the struggle you had figuring out who you were and coming out and, and yeah. you know, how did that impact your, your kind of journey in that way? So I would say growing up, you know, I grew up in Summerside, PEI, a small town, 10,000 people probably at the time, something like that. Um, you know, there weren't any gay people. Obviously there were gay people, but there weren't people like you or me, like, you know, maybe a couple. There was that one weird two men that lived together and they were friends, right? Mm-hmm. There, was, there was a couple of those maybe. There was another uh, uh, guy a couple years older than me, I remember, that went through a pretty rocky coming out. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was probably at the end of high school. Um, Yeah, it didn't didn't go particularly well for him, I don't think, with his family. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember he had gone away to school and he came home, brought a a, a male friend with him, Mm -hmm. and it was gossipy. It's like, who is that? is he or isn't he like what's that it was like this thing right it wasn't cool for him to just say hey guys here I am and here's the guy that I'm dating or here's my boyfriend like that this would have been like in the you know in the 80s well so uh I'm sadly not 30 so um it just like you know my personal view of growing up where I grew up and this isn't a criticism of my family or my people I lived around. That's just the way it was. Um, It, it just wasn't a thing. Like, and so in me, you know, and, you know, I was born in, I was raised in the Catholic church. So there's a whole religion story that we're not going to talk about. Um, It it just wasn't a thing. So any inkling that I may have had back then, it was just kind of like, I'm just going to put that over there because that's not going to happen. This is me. And I truly believed in my heart that I was at the worst bisexual. Um, Mm -hmm. But I met someone who I truly loved, truly had a relationship with. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't a thing Mm -hmm. that I was just doing. It wasn't a cover up. Um, And then you're in that path and then you just live that path, right? You're married, you have young kids. You know, time to be thinking about yourself. You're doing your your thing, mm-hmm. um, and then, as I said, like I went through uh, a difficult time mentally. I would say, um, and then that led me to eventually coming out. 
like even when I first sort of went to therapy to like figure out what the hell was going on with me mm-hmm. it wasn't even about that it was just about like I st- depressed and anxiety and all this stuff and like you start peeling away the layers of the onion and then you get confident enough to say oh there's this other little thing that I put away yeah uh, 25 years ago let's have a little peek at that and mm-hmm. uh you yeah, you know, mm-hmm. trauma. What what was this trauma? <laughs> like exactly. Yeah. Where was this? I put this over yeah. here. Oh, oh crap! It's still there. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, you know, and I, I think it's it's interesting to to, to hear that perspective also because it's something that I can never live. Through. I've never, you know, both from from my upbringing, but also just purely from a generational perspective, let alone anything else. Um, I think it's important for people. You know, probably if someone's listening to this pod, watching this podcast. They're already an ally. They're probably already in your camp. Um, so you're preaching a bit to the choir, I suppose. But that does still exist for some people, I think. Like, totally. when I say things were horrible for two years, like, they were horrible. Mm-hmm. They were like, I wouldn't say I was suicidal. Mm-hmm. But I can see how somebody could get there pretty quickly. Like, there, are, there were thoughts of, there's no way out of this terrible situation I created for myself. Yeah these people would be better off if I just wasn't here. Not to the point where Mm -hmm. that was an actual risk for me, but those, so I can totally see where someone who doesn't have the supports, doesn't have a loving family, doesn't have the uh, 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 stability of their own mental health or this like I therapist, I can totally see how, so I think it's important for us to understand that we have, you know, you had a pretty easy experience and generally generationally it's a lot easier for people your age than mine Mm -hmm. but there's still people out there that go through that period of darkness and maybe in curling oh my god i'm going to be so profound maybe if you've got a welcoming community in the curling community maybe that's all they have you know like that's so important you know i know your experience at the capital winter club uh, which, you know, I think in terms of in Fredericton, like inclusive, supportive environment, you know, the management there and Jamie, the members, like you were already out and proud at that time. But what I've seen happening there and happening with other members and other family uh, of curlers, pretty remarkable. And if they didn't have that sort of inclusive space, you know, the world might be different for those people. Yeah, no, and, and I appreciate you kind of bringing that perspective back. It's like, you know, I, I won't delve too much in, into the politics of it, but obviously, you know, I'm yeah. 23. I lived 21 years in, in Moncton. You're still in Moncton. Um, it's a really dark and scary time right now for a lot of people in the queer community in New Brunswick for a number of reasons. Yeah. But, you know, what, what it, the whole situation in New Brunswick currently has brought out is, again, a conversation of, youth who may not be accepted or in as lucky of a situation as I was. Um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of young people as I grew up who were sent to conversion therapy prior yeah. to it being yeah, criminalized, same. right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I knew a lot of young people who had been sent to, you know, their priest or to therapy or to whatever, um, or, or abused, you know, as well, um, and harmed simply because of who they were. And, you know, that's been a reality for a very long time, but still is. And as much as, you know, as, as you pointed out, as much as it's easier now, shall we say, or it's more uh, welcome or, or kind of, you know, more open in the community and more open in curling, but also, you know, generally in society, there's still a lot of people who do not experience the same welcoming, inclusive um, journey that I did or that perhaps you did at that time. And, um, you know, is it, is it disheartening to think about? Is it hard to think about? Absolutely. But for, for the people who struggle in that way or who have lived that part of their life, um, you know, it, it's not just an experience. It's, it's terrifying and it's painful and it is traumatizing. Um, and can, as you say, can very easily lead to a very dark place very quickly and I think the important thing to take out of all of that is, again, you know, if you might not have school, for example, or if you don't have, you know, your family who are supportive of you, perhaps, 
curling and sports might be the only place you have left. Um, you know, I know even, even for me, despite having kind of a, a loving family and an inclusive school environment at the time, you know, the curling club was still the place where like curling was my therapy for a very long time before I really knew that I, whether I wanted to go to therapy or needed therapy or something, um, you know, that was where I went to kind of just set aside whatever it was I was struggling with. You know, I've, I've been in an abusive relationship before. <laughs> well, how did I deal with that? Well, I was curling competitively at the time. And so right. cur curling was what was my escape from that. Um, you know, as, as you'll recall in my first year university, you know, I had all of my grandparents die in the span of a year. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Right. And so what was my therapy and my escape from that? Well, curling was, um, you know, and, you know, I think that's, that's a relatable thing for a lot of people just generally in life, you know, like you leave your stresses at the door and go and curl. Um, but, you know, for me, that was really the mindset I took to it of like, okay, I've dealt with God knows too much recently or today yeah. or whatever you had a rough year there yeah you yeah. know um and it was a similar thing you know just after I'd come out but you know as I was kind of figuring myself out in the year or so afterwards and then experiencing an abusive relationship after that um it was curling that helped me through that period and the curling community that just didn't stop showing me love and acceptance right. and a lot of people would have absolutely no idea about any of that. But that's part of the point is they didn't know, but still showed me that love that helped me get through that period. Right. Um, and I kind of try to speak to that as much as I can when we talk about you know, inclusivity and curling, because without that kind of nature of the curling community and what, how they treated me both you know, in, in Moncton, but also at the Capital Winter Club, as you mentioned, you know, I wouldn't be able to do some of the things I, I have because I wouldn't have had that support network right. for me. Um, you know, and it's something that every now and then, you know, you can easily forget about, um, but is always something that, that I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for and try to think about as much as I, as I can. Um, you know, particularly reminding curlers and, and people in the curling community that like some of, some of the kind of accepting nature that the curling community has some of it comes from a place of ignorance. And what I mean by that is not knowing, you know, you don't know who the person yeah. you're curling with or curling around and they're just there. And yeah, they might be a nice person to have a drink with or play with or what have you. You don't know what's going on in their life, but you don't care, you know, in the sense of it's-, it's is you're, At this moment, you're just teammates or curling buddies or whatever, yeah. Right, and, and so some of that, you know, and some of the most beautiful experiences I've had in curling have been from, you know, random old men around the curling club who are 75 having a beer with you, not caring who you are or what you are or exactly. how you identify, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they don't know. They don't know. They're <laughs> and, on their way to Right. Yeah. And, and then eventually one of these days, you, some, I'll have the awkward moment where some, some older person will come over to me and be like, so are you? And I'm just like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, just carry yeah. on. <laughs> And, and they, and they don't care yeah. right? because it, you yeah. know, and as I've said to some people, they don't care because at this point they know you. Exactly. And, and I think that's what I was getting at when I talked about my trend, when I came out in the transition with all the people, like they already, people already knew me and their right. opinions of me, good or bad, were already formed. And this didn't, to my knowledge, at least didn't sway any of them. So. Yeah. And, and that's the, the part that I stress sometimes for, for people and, and for people listening is like, again, you don't know what people are going through. And that's right. When, like when someone walks into that door in your curling club, or when someone comes onto the ice to play, you don't know what they've been through during that day. Like forget sexuality and gender identity for a minute, just literally anything, <laughs> any yeah, stressor exactly. of life, let alone, you know, something that's a, a significant struggle like that. Um, you know, so was there anything like in particular that, the curling community did or that you experienced that really made you feel welcome was there there's a particular point that might stand out for you of like you know wow i'm, I'm kind of lucky to be in this community kind of thing i i 
not there wasn't like a moment there was like oh i remember when i was at this event and so and so said something yeah it was just a general like i said i, I you know i came out sort of late summer curling season you know got underway in september october um every time i went to a new event it was a you kind of coming out every time right mm -hmm. when you see somebody new um going to the scotties that year in i'm gonna say sault saint marie i think if i'm not mistaken um was a big one for me like that's my first time i wanted my first time seeing all these people and um it was just that there was no issue like that was the biggest yeah. thing and also a little bit of a little bit of humbling to that too like okay, really, all these people are not spending all their time thinking about you, Daryl, like, right? So there's a little bit of that, right? And you kind of think this is the biggest turmoil in my life. And these all these other people, shockingly, do have their own lives that don't center around me. So um, also kind of not that big of a deal, right? So just the fact that it was not an event or not a, 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 a watershed moment in my life kind of made it one, if if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, fair enough. And I, I think for me as well, there was no like, ah, Eureka. Wow. <laughs> the curling community is so amazing. Um, I think it is just the kind of continuous support aspect that's always really um, been impactful to me is because it continues to remind me anytime something happens in my life. Ah, wow, I'm lucky to be in this in this situation where I have a supportive kind of network around me you know, in curling, let alone the rest of my life. Um, I would say though, like, um, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna blow compliments to you. Like coaching you was an important moment, I'd say in all of that for me, in that, you know, you were out and comfortable. I was out and super comfortable by that point, at that point too. Um, you know, two of the teammates were my two children. So they were comfortable with me. They were obviously comfortable with you. So it was just a very safe, comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that made it okay for me, like as a coach as well. Uh, you know, and I've coached like you guys were like, you know, 17 to 20, I'd say somewhere's in that neighborhood. Um, you know, you're coaching teenage boys, there's a certain kind of behavior a certain kind of uh banter um you know that you might typically expect i felt that on our team there was a, a level of respect mm -hmm. a level of respect for our sexuality among the team there was lots of jokes about it like that's how our team worked everybody ribbed everybody about everything um which is kind of how i deal with stress in life yeah. uh, but it kind of also made it okay to kind of live that out and proud amongst sort of the community right mm -hmm. like the larger curling community and I think that having an athlete that was in that position made it very easy for me as a coach and as a leader to kind of model that too and like and we had conversations i'm driving in the car having conversations about gender identity and trans and pronouns and i was learning stuff and the boys were you even the straight kids were teaching me stuff about that right because you guys are from a generation that i'm not so um i just that kind of environment was also uh, a powerful environment i think to be in and pretty unique that sort of you and i and people that have thoughts and like to talk about stuff kind of lined up too so uh mm -hmm. that was a you know a pretty uh pretty cool moment for me yeah i guess you know from that as well what i would ask is like you know a lot of coaches or people who will coach are watching this and may not have coached a young person who is who is in the queer community or, and who is out or not um you know do you do you, do you have any advice for them and how to handle that or how to deal with that? Because some people maybe may not quite understand how to approach it or how do you, 
you know, tackle that within your team? Like, yes, we eventually had a dynamic where, like, as you spoke to, like, it was everybody joked about everything all the time. And yes, we talked about all kinds of things in the car, on the plane, traveling, wherever, whatever tournament it was, very comfortably, you know. Um, but do, do you have any advice for, for any coaches who maybe... Well, I might turn that around to you coming at it from an athlete's perspective, but I think, you know, as a coach, your job, I've always said this about coaching and I, you know, I think back when I was, I was a coach when I was your age and I certainly probably didn't approach things the same way then as I do now, but now that I'm older, I recognize that as a coach, your job is, you know, obviously to help your team achieve whatever their goals are, right? Right. But when you're coaching juniors, you're helping develop humans. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time together. You know, (laughs) those years, you and I probably spent almost as much time together as you spent with your parents. And as a coach, you've got a responsibility, uh, a big responsibility about contributing to that person growing up as as into an adult. And so... I think just creating a safe environment, I'd say, take your lead from the kid. Um, first of all, like if they're, if they're in, they're out, they're gay, they're straight, it's, it's none of your damn business mm-hmm. on one hand. Right? So it's, it's not your place to be, it's, it's great to be supportive. It's yeah. not your place to try it out of them. Like they'll tell yeah. you when they want to tell you if they have something to tell. You're, you're, uh, you're a supporter, not an instigator. Exactly. And just, Make sure that you, and and this goes across whether it's gender identity, sexuality, uh, mental health, problems at home, school problems, just try to keep an environment where they know that they can talk to you about anything. Like, I think that's important because kind of to your early example, you don't know what they're dealing with at home and what environment that you might be the only person they can talk to. Mm -hmm. So I think as a coach, you need to, to do that. I think that the other thing that I've learned as a coach over the years is, and again, this goes from fixing someone's intern to talking about a problem is you don't have to know it all. So if you're in a spot where you're not comfortable or don't know what to do, reach out to get help from somebody that does like you're, 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 you're one person, you're a conduit. Right. Um, But also you do have a responsibility to be an advocate. And I remember, Will, and I was, I wasn't sure if we'd get to this, but I think it's a time, like, I remember we were in an event mm-hmm. uh, and yeah. I, you know what to say, right? Yeah. And uh, an athlete and another team made some pretty derogatory um, homophobic comments. I honestly forget the details. If it was to you, about you, about somebody else, doesn't matter. But anyway, you were on the ice and this person made these comments and uh, you came off the ice and I never seen you fuming like you were fuming (laughs) and told me this, right? And um, I chose to have a conversation with the other coach, Mm -hmm. right? Super fortunate. It's someone that I've known that I knew quite well. They knew my situation. So it was a very comfortable conversation to me, firm conversation and they were appreciative and, 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 and did what they did with it. I don't, I don't know, but um, so I guess I'd turn that question back to you to say, as an athlete being out there, you know, put yourself in the shoes of a kid that's struggling to come out or maybe not as comfortable as you, what would you look for from your coach and feel free to say what I did wasn't it. That's I'm also comfortable with that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like what, you know, what advice would you give to a coach as an athlete, you know, from an athlete's perspective? Yeah. And, and I, I, I appreciate that as well. Cause I, that's the only situation in curling where I've ever experienced that. And, you know, I consider myself lucky to have only experienced it once. Um, you know, and, and as that happened, you know, it was an athlete beside me on the sheet next to us said something about a, a younger uh, kid they were playing against on a team that had some kids who were stereotypically, you might say, ah, they might be, didn't validate it at all, obviously, but the comment was made and, you know, they were losing and it was not a game they should have lost and what have you. Anyway, um, and so the comment comes out and both of us are in the hack. And so I'm sitting in the hack 
while they are sitting in the hack and set it. And my teammates at the time, credit to them, heard it, did not quite know what to do, and just looked at me like, uh, what's Will going to do? And in my mind in that moment, I was like, okay, Will, you have a choice. I can they walk were over there. wondering if they were going to have to hold you back. No, really. And I talked to them afterwards, and that was exactly what it was. Because I was like, and in fairness to them, in my mind, I was like, I have two choices beat the tar out of this kid, or, or <laughs> take the high road and how do I deal with this properly? Right. Because making a scene out of it and, and you know, having a yelling match then and there was not going to fix anything, solve the situation, or educate anybody at all on what was happening or why it mattered, or why it was offensive, Put it, putting it mildly. Um, and so I said, OK, well, they've all heard it. Their teammates scolded them for saying it, thankfully. Oh, do they? I don't remember that part, yeah. Yeah, it, it was one of those where they were like, OK, we banter sometimes, but like, what the heck was that? Um, you can't say that. Uh, I believe one of them did say that, say, you know, you, you just can't say that. Um, and so I said to myself, okay, well, I'm going to tell you. And then I've removed myself from the situation, but also there can be a learning moment from this that I, that, that I right. can instigate from there. Right. Again, whatever the coach did with that is whatever they did with it, but it yeah. provided the opportunity to learn about why it mattered, why it was wrong and not to do it again. And then, Fairness, it never happened again. Um, and I think that's a bit of a lesson to coaches and how to deal with it is no matter what your feelings are about it or no matter what your thoughts are about it, if you have a teammate, a, a teammate or a player that you're coaching, you know, I think the, the proper term you used was you have to be their advocate. Like no matter what it is, you know, if it's a situation in any type of form in curling where, you know, something happens, whether it's rules, whether it's something, you know, is messed up or someone says something inappropriate to, to another player, you know, especially when you're in juniors, but even in the adult game, if something goes wrong, like you are the other person who's supposed to come and advocate for your team and kind of take the hit as it were. Um, and you did that. Well, that's what you have to do for, for a young person who, again, you don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know what they're struggling with. You don't know what, like you might be the only support person that they have. Right. right? And so in that moment when something happens, whether in, you know, in, in this instance, you know, someone, someone uses a slur or if there's an offensive moment that takes place or what have you of any kind, like it is your role to be that person's advocate and that person's supporter in that moment. Because if you aren't, that may have an incredibly negative impact, not just on, on your own player in that moment in their life, you know, because if you had gone out and said to me, that's, that's not my problem. Like, <laughs> see yeah, you later. I'm, boys, right? yeah. See yeah. you later. I'm done. Thank you. Goodbye. Right. That would have been my response. Um, but, you know, you, you don't know what, if that person has any other kind of support in that moment. And so I think it's, you know, that, that point of being your player's advocate um, is a really important one to recognize and, and to understand at, at any time, whether it's talking about sexuality or gender identity or, or anything else, especially for teenagers, because we do all kinds of dumb stuff on the ice. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just thought, you know, and I said, I, I preface this by saying, you know, people that are listening that, you know, knew me 20, 30 years ago, I would, you know, I'm sure I made all kinds of ethical faux pas. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I've grown older, I really believe that my job as a coach is to help form you play my little role and help form my four or five athletes into the best grown ups they can be. And that's whether it's being respectful about gender, sexuality, making sure you go and shake hands and thank the Bonspiel organizers before we leave the rink. Um, don't wear your hat at dinner. Like, this is your job. That's part of your job uh, is treating, don't be slamming your broom on the ice, like all that stuff. Um, that's part of the job you sign up for when you're a coach. Like it's not just about winning championships and you never know when you might be the biggest influence on somebody. Um, you just don't know. 
Um, you might be a, nothing but a blip on the radar for some person and you might have impact that you'll never know on somebody else. So I, I just think you always need to think that. Yeah, and, and I would also say like, you know, you threw credit my way, I'll throw credit yours. You're coaching a team and coach me for six years, seven years, however long it was. Um, it felt longer. <laughs> it felt long. Um, but both of your kids are on the team, right? Yeah, yeah. And me. And it's like, you know, a lot of people could make the choice of, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support my kids as much as I can because they are your children. And of course that, that happens outside of that as well. But in terms of curling, there was not a single moment in my entire time where I felt less supported than anyone else on the team at all. Oh, thank ever, you. Right? Yeah. And like, we're pretty high maintenance, well, so there's that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty high maintenance, and Josh was fairly low maintenance. So, like, you know, <laughs> it's true. It kind of balances out, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think the other thing, you know, in credit to the, like the teammates I've had, and again, this speaks to like part of the curling community we're talking about, is that like they cared so deeply about me and what I was going through all the time, yeah. any time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That, that I had that support, even when I didn't know necessarily that I needed it. Like when you curl with someone for more than half a decade, you get to know pretty well, like, ah, Will is pissed off or <laughs> something yeah, yeah, yeah. is off yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone's looking at himself today. And, and that, was, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was huge for me as well. Um, I think just as we get towards the end of this, I just want to kind of ask, like, you know, do you, when you kind of look at curling and think about things you've done, things you've experienced, you know, coaching me or what have you, like, what are a couple of lessons that you think people watching this should take away of, like, how do you deal with gender identity and sexuality in curling? Because it is something that everyone has to learn about all the time, and it is a, a a kind of never-ending learning experience and of understanding um but would you have any kind of advice or, or lessons for folks um I, you know i don't know that that profound i think i think it's just about being open and accepting and accepting like you know i think you're you either have or you're going to be talking about talking to karen here in a couple of weeks like i remember or in, in another another podcast like i remember being at the scotties and there was a whole story about her and her partner at the time that was a big deal right um john epping you know greg smith big deal right um because it's kind of firsts that or, or first that we're aware of yeah. right like there's gay guys when I curled in the briar, well, obviously, but I was I wasn't out or or even accepting at that point. But um, you know, I look at you know who was the briar this year, and I was like, oh, look at there's him and there's him, and there's him. Like, it, they're not wearing it on their on their on their shoulders, but they're not hiding it either. You just you know, it's a small world, and you just know. Um, I think it's about not making assumptions about who people are and what they are. I think it's about. Um, I do subscribe to it. it's none of your damn business. Like one of the, one of the things that bugs me the most as a gay man is, you know, and this happens to me when curling's on TV and some some guy that is a little flouncy is on there and they say, you know, and then the people, my friends are like, oh, do you think he might be? Mm -hmm. I don't know, he, you know, or maybe I do, but whatever, none of your business. Like, so there's a little bit of that. Um, um I, I just think it's about and, and curling in general, I'm happy to see is being a lot more inclusive and a lot more representative now than it certainly was when I was your age, right? You're seeing people from all different communities starting to show up at you know at the curling club and eventually starting to show up at, at major championships on TV and stuff, but just as society is. And I think that. You know, one of us said, I don't remember who, but that might be their only space. And let's make it a happy space for people, no matter what gender they are, no matter what, how they identify, no matter what pronouns they use today. And if they change their pronouns from today to tomorrow, just this is a sport and it's meant for fun or it's meant for competition towards some sort of excellence. And either way, there's room for all of us. So let's just do that. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a message that that most people can resonate with and, and I certainly can I think 
the only thing that I would really <laughs> add to that as a lesson from my perspective is that you don't need to understand someone fully in order to respect them. I love that. Yeah, 100 percent. Right? Is that in, in curling, you run into so many different people from so many different walks of life that just show them the same level of respect you would show everyone else. And if you run into somebody who may use they, them pronouns, or who may be a drag queen sometimes, or who may be gay, may not be gay, again, it might not be any of your damn business, but show them the same respect, even though you may not understand it. And if if you are so lucky to develop a relationship with that person to an extent that you're comfortable, you can talk about those things in a respectful way, right? And be open. If you're somebody who might be scared about, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say the wrong thing and I don't want to approach this incorrectly. First of all, credit to you. <laughs> That's, you know, being sensitive to those conversations or to those identities or, or what have you is important. Um, but making sure you lay your biases or lay your humility on the table first and say, I don't know or understand this, but I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to hear it from you. And even if someone speaks to you and says, well, I use you know, they, them pronouns because of whatever reason, and you go, I don't quite get that. That's okay, but don't judge them for it, right? Still show exactly. them that same respect. Um, and that goes for sport, that goes for life, that goes for any of those moments. But again, when you're walking into a curling club and you don't know what anyone's gone through or you don't know what they're dealing with, again, regardless of sexuality or gender identity, show them the same level of respect you would anybody else in your club. And you'll come to find out that, that you'll be developing a more inclusive and safer space for everybody, let alone the person you're interacting with. I... Uh, I think that might be just about as good a space as any to end uh, this. Thank you, Daryl, for for taking the time to do to do this with me. Thanks, Will. Like honestly, thanks for reaching out and and thanks for doing this. Like I think it's uh, I really kudos to Curling Canada. I think they're really going uh, above and beyond to do their best in terms of making curling an even more inclusive sport than it, I think it already is. Um, Lots of cool things happening uh, with you, Goldline, Andrew Perez, other folks. Um, um, congrats and uh, good luck in your podcast. Thank good luck you. In your thank you. Thank you. So, um, again, thanks to Curling Canada for allowing this to happen um, and for giving me a platform to do it and have conversations with, with Daryl and so many other people. Um, even though Daryl and I have known each other for a very long time, um, it's still uh, the first opportunity we've had to have this kind of a discussion. So thank you to, to Curling Canada to really do that. Um, this has been the Curling for Change podcast. I am Will. This has been Daryl. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please do share it with people you know. Uh, please, if you're watching on YouTube, give it a like or subscribe to the channel and make sure to always respect people no matter where they come from. Thanks, everyone.